Mama Yeshi Lo Sol Rinpoche's From a Mountain in Tibet, A Monk's Journey. A Child of Tibet. My earliest memory is of playing with my friends. Our game was killing birds. I don't recall whose idea it was or whether we were competing to see whose hunting skills were the best. Probably we were bored and looking for something to do, full of the restless excitement typical of children all over the world. We had no toys, which were unknown in our society, and no school teachers to direct our energies. Our parents were hard at work in the fields, and we had nothing to do but go in search of amusement. I do remember the feel of the catapult in my hand, and my pride in my skill when the small stone struck a bird, and it fell to the ground. We all knew it was wrong. Of course we did. Do not kill is one of the five precepts that every Buddhist person is enjoined to uphold. Those precepts to abstain from killing any living being, from stealing, sexual misconduct, lying and intoxication, were a fact of life. No adult in my village would kill any creature, even for meat. So part of our excitement was about transgression. We had taken ourselves off to the edge of the village, to the banks of the river where we would not be detected. One of us swiped at the weeds to send the birds flying up in a panic, and another aimed his catapult to bring down his prey. All of us shouted in glee when someone hit a strike. I don't think we were considering even for a second how the birds felt. I know I wasn't. I don't remember feeling any remorse, either at that time or later. If we had ever been discovered, we would have been punished, but nobody ever found out. It was not comfortable, that memory. Neither is the fact that it was not the last time I would break the commandment not to kill. But I acknowledge that I have not lived a life free of error. Far from it. This, I believe, is what makes my life potentially instructive. I was born and grew up in a tiny village named Darak. It lay at the junction of two of the biggest rivers in Tibet, the Gomchu and the Zachu, which go on to become the Mekong. Our province was called Kham in eastern Tibet. As a child, I knew that Chamdo, the province's principal town, was a day's ride away, and that the monastery of Doma Locking lay some three days' travel by horse to the west. Beyond that, at a vast territory, was Lhasa, the capital city. Neither I nor my immediate family had ever been there. But we received news from merchants who arrived to sell their goods, and from the occasional lama or priest, passing through on his way to or from his monastery. It was hard for me to imagine the Dalai Lama's great palace or the splendid temples, because in my village there was scarcely more than a dozen houses, scattered up and down the green hills, connected by paths worn by our feet and the feet of our animals. There was no central village hall, no religious or institutional building of any kind. Lhasa felt as remote as the moon and almost as mysterious. My birth name was Jampal Drakpa, or Jamdrak for short, and I grew up lacking for nothing, surrounded by an abundance of love, support, and devotion. I was born in the year of the water sheep, which was 1943 in the Western calendar and I believe I was born in September. I don't know exactly, because we had neither clocks nor calendars in our village. We didn't need them. The only time that mattered was the turning of the seasons, which governed when to plant, when to take animals to the high pastures, 
and when to harvest. The precise day on which a person was born mattered very little to us, because we did not count the days. For us you were young until you were old. I was the youngest of four surviving brothers. There had been another boy born before me, but he died before receiving a name. Jam Yang, Chong Jiao, Paulden, Drakpa, and Karma, Sherab, Chuki, Nima. And I had two younger sisters, Yang Chen, Lamo, and Zimi. I lived with my mother, father, an older cousin whom I knew as Auntie, and my two sisters. My mother was endlessly loving, a large woman whose embrace seemed to wrap me up completely. Since I was the smallest boy, she, along with everyone else, indulged me in everything. All the family units in my village were related by marriage, if not blood. Everyone was an aunt or uncle, a cousin or kinsman. Every adult I knew would clip me on the side of the head if I was slow to come when called, feed me if I was hungry, or embrace me if I was crying at some minor childhood mishap. My world was contained by the familiar landscape we children roamed through as we played, and by the care of the adults who had known me since the day I was born. The mountains in Kham form jagged peaks that soar to 18,000 feet, about 5.4 kilometers. And when I was a child, they still housed mystics in caves, meditating for months in hermitages with eagle-eye views. Kham had been the center of a great military power in pre-Buddhist Tibet had been fought over for centuries by Mongols and Chinese, and was always politically and economically powerful. It was one of the highest inhabited places in the world, and even now is dauntingly remote. But its valleys are fertile, and abundant in comparison with its barren highlands. It was a pristine wilderness it gave us everything we needed, but required our respect. Western people are sometimes surprised to discover that Tibet is not a completely snow-bound country, despite its high altitude. It is usually too dry for snow, since most of the rain is blocked by the Himalaya mountains. During the winter months the cold catches in the throat. Despite the fierce glare of the ever-present sun, you can suffer frostbite and sunstroke on the same day. Starting our reflections about a mountain in Tibet with the first chapter. The Shushi children at age didn't have a, a real true, true, true sense of what he was doing wrong. Mm. They didn't have that that sen sense in them so much, and they, and I can see when they start something that they, they get carried away the, 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 the thought the thoughts carry them away. Yes, the excitement of it. Yeah, the, the adrenaline that, and that, the yeah that carried them on. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. See, there were no parents there to guide them and tell them tell them they were they were on their own without guidance. So, so they were just wild and free. That's right. Yes, so that's the way that was, and it's nice how we all come together. We're all loving and kind to each other and, and helping to one another. And the, the parents, they, went, they worked very hard getting the crops and sorting out the cattle, and, and coming back, they'll have, have all the cooking and all that to do. and, and and, and, they, and of course, at the same time, they're glad to see their children as well. So that was was a a, a nice, happy situation. And uh, well, that's it. It's good that they're all been very helpful and kind. So in a small, small community like that, uh, 
well, they're more, they're more connected, you know, in a situation. They start off thinking about each other, caring for one another. Yeah, yeah. And also recognizing their interdependence, don't you think? That's right. How it's all, it's all interconnected. Yeah. Well, I'm sure when the parents came back and mm. gave them a hug and, and, and nursed them and say, uh, we're showing them, showing them kindness. Yeah. They're showing what kindness is, you know, children. Will. So children pick up, pick these things up when they're young, you know, these, these tips about being very kind and generous and so forth, you know. So it's a good foundation for later caring about lots of people. Yeah, aye. It usually would, it would sometimes would have leave something behind to look after the children, but that didn't happen in that situation. <laughs> yeah, you know. But they're all, all at work and so Running maybe, free. Maybe they all needed, needed all the bodies for, for the work, for the work, you know. Yes. So that's that, I suppose. Okay. Mm. Great. Yeah.